While the level of corruption within the British police is occasionally reported in the mainstream media, the true depth of misconduct and corruption is largely ignored. So in this report we're going to examine some of the most recent cases that highlight the crimes and corruption by those who are entrusted to protect us and how for decades British police have repeatedly failed to protect the victims of Jimmy Savile. There is now overwhelming evidence that demonstrates how the police abuse their position of authority by either committing or completely ignoring crimes. Just this week new figures reveal that almost half of all UK officers would not report fellow officers for violent behaviour towards suspects. A new study into police ethics by the Open University found that up to 46% of officers would potentially turn a blind eye to their colleagues punching and beating suspects. Only 54% of police officers claim they would definitely report violent behaviour. The study which polled 520 officers across three forces in the UK found that almost one in five would definitely not report a colleague who ran a private security business. 17% would definitely not report officers who accepted unsolicited gifts while on duty. Uh, one in four would definitely not report officers who accepted food and alcohol on occasions. Officers were presented with 11 possible scenarios and asked what action they would take in each. Author of the study, Dr. Louise Westmoreland, senior lecturer in criminology at the Open University, said the findings show that there is a blue wall of silence within the police. She also said, the findings of this study reveal that officers seem uncertain of the rules and regulations covering their behaviour, especially at the lower end of the spectrum. In other words, officers were not clear about the bending of rules covering minor offences such as working in their spare time or accepting free drinks and small gifts. Public trust in the police is continuing to decline and has been damaged in no small part due to the level of corruption uncovered by the Leveson inquiry, the Hillsborough cover-up and the failure to protect abuse victims from paedophile Jimmy Savile. In fact, just this week it emerged that Jimmy Savile had boasted about his police contacts who would help him to destroy sexual abuse claims made against him. It appears that Savile had created an inner circle of police officers who met at his penthouse apartment in Leeds on a weekly basis. A report by Detective Superintendent John Savile claimed that while being interviewed under caution by Surrey Police, Jimmy Savile had said that he had contacts within the police and whenever he received letters alleging that he had done something wrong, he gave them to his police contacts to get rid of. Apparently dubbed the Friday Morning Club, which met for almost 20 years, it had up to nine former or serving police officers as members. The report claims that Savile also stated that officers read and destroyed the letters. If one of the letters concerned him, then he could have it forensically examined as a favour if he needed. One victim has spoken out about the lack of police action and said, I want this to be investigated as I feel there must have been a cover-up. I find it extraordinary that he was telling police that another force was aware of more allegations against him and it wasn't followed up. I can't imagine nobody knew what he was doing. She added, it's one thing to strip him of his knighthood but it's not good enough when he could have been brought to justice when alive. No officers from either Surrey or West Yorkshire Police have been disciplined and there might be some truth in what Savile had to say as West Yorkshire Police do not have any claims of his abuse in their system. In 2007 two complaints were made to Surrey Police alleging that Savile had sexually abused two girls and sexually assaulted another, but police only investigated one allegation of sexual assault. But it's not just Surrey and West Yorkshire Police who turned a blind eye to years of Savile's abuse. It also appears 
that he had protection from North Yorkshire police. Jimmy Savile had spent a lot of his life in Scarborough and was alleged to be part of a paedophile ring in the area that included the mayor of Scarborough, Peter Giaconelli. North Yorkshire police claim the first they heard about Savile committing abuse was in 2012 when two women came forward. However, this is not true. In 2003, the police force conducted a major investigation into a paedophile ring operating in the area and according to press reports, Seville's name was constantly mentioned but they completely ignored this line of inquiry. In fact, Seville was never even questioned by North Yorkshire police despite several allegations being made against him. Even in his own 1974 autobiography, Seville claimed that he received six girls as payment from a Yorkshire council for appearing as a special guest at a council function. While the decades of abuse has been widely reported in the mainstream media, little has been mentioned about the police's response during that time. In 2008, a complaint was made to Sussex Police that Seville had sexually assaulted a woman in her early 20s in the back of a caravan. In the 1980s, he assaulted a girl in his caravan at the BBC Centre. Again, the police were informed, but it led to nothing. Likewise with victim John Gibbon, who reported sexual assault to the London Met in the 80s, and the police didn't even bother to call him back. There could be potentially hundreds of cases where the police ignored complaints made about Seville and his accomplices. We have to wonder why a paedophile and his friends were allowed to continue a monstrous reign of abuse and even more disturbingly, we have to ask ourselves who else has been allowed to commit horrendous acts like this with impunity and why? Putting the Jimmy Savile case to one side for a moment, there is a cesspool of misconduct and corruption within the police and the mainstream media often fails to report it. And when police officers are found guilty of a crime, the punishment is often lenient. For example, this week, a Met Police Officer, Christopher Exley, was dismissed after admitting to four counts of making indecent images of children following a proactive investigation by the force's paedophile unit. And another Met Officer, PC Stephen Holt, was just sacked for committing housing benefit fraud and sentenced to only 200 hours of community service. Hampshire Police Officer Rob Swift Simmons received a two-year suspended sentence and was ordered to pay £300 in prosecution costs and a £100 victim surcharge after a gun was found in his home. Now one incident that did receive widespread media attention was PC Simon Howard, the officer who killed protester Ian Tomlinson. And he was not convicted of a crime, he was merely sacked and he was even allowed to keep his pension entitlement. And sometimes officers who commit crimes receive no punishment at all. Many of you will remember the case of Carissa Dick, the officer with connections to Common Purpose, who gave the order for police to execute John Charles de Menzies on the London Underground. She actually received a promotion. These are just recent examples of police misconduct and corruption and it could be argued that these are isolated incidents but if we step back and look at the bigger picture we can clearly see there is a culture of corruption within the British police. Figures obtained by the Liberal Democrats last year showed that over 1,000 police officers have criminal convictions and many of them for violent crimes. In addition a Freedom of Information Act request filed by myself showed that 263 Met officers were disciplined for misconduct between 2011 and 2012 for offences that include assault, harassment, unlawful arrest and even rape. Also in December 2012, the Daily Mail reported a 62% rise in police corruption investigations with anti-corruption units facing 245 new cases every month. Now, I'm not suggesting that all police officers are corrupt Far from it, in fact, it's true that many police officers are indeed the thin blue line that protect the public from criminals. And they often perform a largely hostile and thankless job. However, the amount of officers who abuse their position of authority 
cannot be denied and much like the rest of the establishment some elements within the police force are only concerned with protecting its own well that's all from me for today for more news that you're not supposed to know visit rymph.com i'm mcmeany signing off for rymph news We live in a society where exposing vital truths is an arrestable offence, where political dissent is no longer tolerated, and where whistleblowers are labelled as a threat to national security. So in this report we're going to look at a recent case where an activist who shared vital information has been persecuted. While the mainstream media focuses on high profile cases like Julian Assange and Bradley Manning, now as important as these cases are and certainly need to remain in the public eye. Other less reported activists are also being persecuted and that, in my opinion, needs to be highlighted too. For example, it was revealed this week that Barrett Brown, a 31-year-old activist, will now spend a year in jail without trial. The federal trial against his alleged computer crimes has been pushed back six months, delaying the trial until September 2013. Brown was scheduled to stand trial later this month but at the request of his attorneys, legal proceedings have been delayed. Doug Morris, a public defender appointed to serve as Brown's defence counsel, asked for an extension in order to evaluate the evidence against his client. Brown was arrested last September within hours of posting a video on YouTube that criticised an FBI agent. A SWAT team raided his home in Dallas, Texas and placed him in custody for almost one month before charging him with threatening a federal officer. In December, while in custody, Brown was charged for a second time, this time for sharing a hyperlink in a chat room. A month later, he was charged for a third time for obstructing justice by knowingly and corruptly conceal and attempt to conceal records, documents, and digital data contained on two laptop computers. Brown had previously been a well-known commentator on the activist group Anonymous, and he shared some of the same ideologies as the group. As a result, the mainstream media had branded him as a spokesperson for Anonymous, a role which he denies. Writing from his prison cell, he states, I am not and never have been the spokesman for Anonymous, nor its public face or worse, self-proclaimed face, a spokesperson or leader. He first experienced legal problems in March of last year when FBI agents raided his home for computers that contained information pertaining to, among other things, the Anonymous Collective and the offshoot LulzSec. Anonymous had obtained gigs worth of data from servers belonging to Stratfor, a US intelligence company. Now Brown is not being blamed for hacking into Stratfor servers, but for merely sharing a link to an archive of the files. While Brown is being charged for sharing a dozen credit card numbers, the information obtained by Anonymous include millions of emails from within Stratford. The data was handed over to WikiLeaks after the hack, and the data has been steadily published by the whistleblower website. Brown explains in the wake of the recent operation by which Stratford servers were compromised, much of the media has focused on the fact that some participants in the attack chose to use obtained customer credit card numbers to make donations to charitable causes. Although this aspect of the operation is indeed newsworthy and, like all things, should be scrutinised and criticised as necessary, the original purpose and ultimate consequence of the operation has largely been ignored. 
Stratford was not breached in order to obtain customer credit card numbers which the hackers in question could not have expected to be as easily obtainable as they were. Rather, the operation was pursued in order to obtain the 2.7 million emails that exist on the firm's servers. The emails obtained by Anonymous revealed that the US had secretly created Trapwire, a detailed surveillance system more accurate than modern facial recognition technology, and covertly installed it right across the globe. The emails also revealed that law enforcement officials had spied on Occupy Wall Street protesters and showed that the US intended to remove the now deceased Hugo Chavez. While it's clear that the establishment, including the mainstream media, attempt to scare the public by labelling ethical activist groups like Anonymous and their associates as cyber terrorists. These groups have actually placed more vital information into the public domain than any government or news agency. Remember that most of these activist groups abide by the international rules of war which is more than can be said for most Western governments. Most groups like Anonymous, Occupy and WikiLeaks are a response to the secretive and corrupt establishment, holding governments and the corporations that control it to account. We have a right to know what governments are doing in our name, and we have a right to know that they are using our tax dollars to further an imperialist agenda. And the fact that the establishment views these groups as a threat only further supports the accusation that the establishment is not interested in serving or protecting the people, but only interested in self-preservation and protecting its own business interests, and that is so determined to hide multiple levels of corruption that it will attempt to ridicule or silence anyone who reveals too much. Such action can only be tolerated by the general public for so long. Well that's all from me for today, thank you for watching, and please share this information with everyone you know. For more news that you're not supposed to know, visit rinf.com. I'm Mick Meany, signing off for Rinf Alternative News. It seems that the London Met Police aren't content with spying on a mere 57,000 people a year. It has emerged this week that they consider buying access to innocent citizens' private data, including their gender, their age, their postcodes, who they made phone calls to and when, and even details of their web and app usage. The Sunday Times claims that a market research company Ipsos Mori, in conjunction with EE, the UK's largest mobile phone operator, placed shoppers on Oxford Street under covert surveillance. The Sunday Times reports, as shoppers emerged into daylight, they pulled out their smartphones, the websites they visited were being monitored en masse. The surveillance was part of a trial by Ipsos Mori to snoop on the habits of millions of EE phone customers. They could monitor how many of the phone users checked their Facebook account or the website of their favourite shop. Ipsos Mori was delighted with the results in a deal with EE, which formed in 2010 from a merger between Orange and T-Mobile. The polling firm Ipsos Mori had purchased the exclusive use of the phone data and the test run in central London had shown its potential. 
The report also claims that Ipsos Mori attempted to sell citizens' personal data to the Met Police. Ipsos Mori also allegedly ran another location tracking trial last summer on Olympic visitors and shoppers with a document claiming we can understand not only where people are going but what they have been doing before, during and after they visit these various locations. The company of course defended their intention to sell personal data in a statement they said in response to the article published today by the Sunday Times, Ipsos Mori absolutely refutes the suggestion that it is offering access to individual personal data for sale. However, according to PC Pro, in Ipsos Mori's latest round of results, it claimed to have the ability to access EE's entire database and thus to analyze the behavior of groups of people in real time. Also, T-Mobile, which merged with Orange to form EE, has previously admitted to selling data to other companies. In other news, in the United States, a Freedom of Information Act request by the Civil Liberties Union has revealed that the FBI has been reading private emails without warrant using a law from the 1980s. The ACLU have said new documents from the FBI and US Attorney's Office paint a troubling picture of the government's email surveillance practices. Not only does the FBI claim it can read emails and other electronic communications without a warrant, even after a federal appeals court ruled that doing so violates the Fourth Amendment, but the documents strongly suggest that different US attorneys' offices around the country are applying conflicting standards to access communications content. The FBI provided the ACLU with excerpts from two versions of its Domestic Investigations and Operations Guide from 2008 and 2012. One of the guides is from before Warshak was decided and the other is from after, but they say the same thing. FBI agents only need a warrant for emails or other electronic communications that are unopened and less than 180 days old. The 2012 guide contains no mention of Warshak and no suggestion that the Fourth Amendment might require a warrant for all emails. In fact, the 2012 guide states in enacting the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986, Congress concluded that customers may not retain reasonable expectation of privacy in information sent to network providers if the content of an unopened message are kept beyond six months or stored on behalf of the customers after the email has been received or opened, it should be treated the same as a business record in the hands of a third party, such as an accountant or attorney. In that case, the government may subpoena the records from the third party without running afoul of either the Fourth or Fifth Amendment. The Think Progress website reports the law governing access to email and cloud stored data was passed at a time when the cost of online storage was so high it seemed unthinkable that anyone would store data there indefinitely. So anything left on network storage for longer than 180 days was considered abandoned and required only an administrative subpoena to access. But in the time since it became law, the price of online storage went down and many people started to rely on free cloud-based email solutions like Gmail or Yahoo. There have been numerous efforts to update the ECPA to be more in line with current consumer behavior and the Fourth Amendment, but none as of yet have succeeded. The most recent attempt to update the law to clearly require a probable cause warrant hit a major milestone in April when a standalone fix was approved by the Senate. Rep Matt Salmon introduced a companion bill to the House although a similar proposal had already been introduced earlier this year. Again, these revelations demonstrate just how little respect the authorities have for our privacy and our personal information. And it will go to extreme lengths to obtain our data without cause or provocation. 
Well, I'm almost out of time for today. And now for something a little bit different, here's some truth poetry. So that's all for me for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. I'm Mick Meany, signing off for Info Alternative News. I know, I know, I know, I know, I don't know a lot about, 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 about politics, I know. But what I do know is I'll let you know, and I know that you probably already know what I know, but I'm just letting you know what I know, because I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. There's a Westminster, I know there's a Downing Street, I know there's an office, I know there's a cabinet, but hey, I've got a cabinet in my front room, big deal. I know we've got something in common, because they've got the House of Commons, and I've got a house, and that's really quite common. But I know, that's about as far as it goes. Because I know we're from a completely different ilk. I mean, they've even taken Robert Kilroy Silk. I know there's a guy called Dave. And I know that Dave's got a pet poodle called Nick. I know there's a backbench. I know there's a Chancellor of the Exchequer. I know there was a saucy Edwina Curry home wrecker. I know there's a Paxman. I know there's bankers. And I like to call those bankers something that rhymes with bankers, but it's not bankers. And it's not fuel disputing tankers. But it's all about the bankers. All right. Fat greedy. I know there's a question time, I know there's a big question they argue about things like traffic congestion, of which there's a, a controversial charge, I know there's a character called Boris at large, the exchange between he and a guy called Ken can get quite fruity, quite fiery, with stern looks, I know there's a call sort of Brooks and Levison inquiry, I know they're only going to put tax on a good old Cornish pasty, really? Well that's just nasty. I know, I know there's a finance minister who appears to be rather sinister. I know there's chauffeur driven cars. I know there's expensive shirts and ties and abundance of lies. We need answers, not underhand tactics and private dancers. I know there was a home parliament, but saddened when I realised it wasn't literal. I hope that they were hung upside down so we could shake them all around. And their purses, their wallets, their spare change will fall to the ground. That way we might just get some of our money back. I know they're pumping more and more into unnecessary war, excessively disused property and not enough to combat poverty. I know when the shit hits the fan we'll be left to carry the shake and can to clean up the mess. But it's alright as long as we can form and just say yes. I know that the justice system is all messed up. Ridiculous decisions and who can do more? The politicians. But they don't because when a police officer at the G20 summit pushes an innocent man to the ground moments later that man died. Murder, surely, at the very least, manslaughter. But hey, they say, wrong time, wrong place. Either way, it's a f***ing disgrace as he walks from court a free man. And you know as the day is long, it is so wrong. But when a single mum steals bread from the shop to feed the starving mouths of her children, she'll get punished. I mean, where is the justice? When the next generation stab and gun each other down, left to rot to drown in the pool of their own blood to die. Guess who turns a blind eye? And I know, I know, I don't know a lot about politics, I know. And I know that you probably already know what I know, but I'm just letting you know what I know. And I think I know what is wrong, and I think I know what is right. And I think I know that they need to open their eyes and see what is going on. Have a look around and listen to us, the people, the people. And I will shout to you because I think they, the politicians, could do something about it. But hey, speaking as one of the people, what do I know? Thank you. When it comes to your online privacy, just how respectful are Google? Are the rumours of CIA involvement true? And what kind of diversion tactics are they using to throw us off the scent? Welcome to Rinf News, I'm Mick Meany and in this report we'll take a closer look at what's going on behind the scenes with Google and their apparent total disregard for your privacy. While most in the mainstream media and alternative media will focus on Google Glasses which are invasive and a genuine cause for concern, today we're going to look at some of the statements the company has made. We're going to take a look through the recent track record of privacy abuses. Even this week, Google's executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, and Jared Cohen of Google Ideas bizarrely made hypocritical statements at the company's Big Tent event about the increasing need to protect our privacy, while conveniently ignoring the fact 
that they actively profit from destroying it. Consider then the audacity of Eric Schmidt's statement that we have to fight for our privacy or we're going to lose it because it's so easy to lose. Yes, Schmidt, you're right because you're part of a small cabal that's invested heavily in taking it away from us. The duo also attempted to blame the younger generation for the dramatic loss of privacy, despite research that continues to prove them wrong. Bilderberg Group regular Eric Schmidt said, as you age, more and more of your digital identity is determined by others, and that record is something new generations will live with for the rest of their lives. His sidekick Cohen interjected, kids are coming online and saying things that will follow them around for the rest of their lives. Schmitz continued, each of you completely expects Google to maintain the integrity of data you share with us. It will be a huge problem if data was leaked or inappropriately given to governments. I'll leave the obvious hypocrisy to one side for a moment and point out that the latest research figures demonstrate that children and teenagers are concerned about their privacy and actively take steps to protect it. A joint research by the Pew Research Centre and the Berkman Centre for Internet Society has shown that teenagers take a variety of technical and non-technical steps to manage the privacy of information, with only 8% believing that setting privacy controls is somewhat difficult. But Schmidt, who once said, we know where you are, we know where you've been, we can more or less know what you're thinking about, chose to ignore this at the Big Ten event. Google's privacy issues and lawsuits are well documented, but less reported, however, are the company's ties to the NSA and its connections to the CIA. Now, as recently as one month ago, leaked emails from Stratford revealed that Google is getting White House and State Department support and air cover. In reality, they are doing things the CIA cannot do. The US government can then disavow knowledge and Google is left holding the bag. Press TV reported that among the Stratford emails that WikiLeaks received were some exposing Google as not just an intelligence contractor for the CIA and Department of Defense, but foreign governments as well. Text within the highly sensitive cables outlines criminal and even terrorist activities on the part of Google, including the planning of insurgency operations. Google has helped plan military operations against Syria and has been directly involved working with Arab states and Turkey to plan destabilization of Iran. In 2010, Wired reported about the development of technology that scours tens and thousands of websites, blogs, and Twitter accounts to find the relationships between people, organizations, actions, and incidents now both present and still to come. The technology created by Recorded Future, a company that both Google and the CIA have invested in, goes beyond search by looking at the invisible links between documents that talk about the same or related entities and events. And speaking of real-time monitoring, in 2008, a disturbing video produced by Consumer Watchdog demonstrated how Google's web browser, Chrome, actually records what a web user types into the web address field and then shockingly sends that information back to Google. Well, if that sounds like a step too far, well, watch this video and make up your own mind. After I type a few letters of my search, but before I click the Google search button, Google proactively looks up my search based on the first few letters. This is a very convenient feature, but it raises a concern too. From the moment I type those first few letters, Google is already tracking, uploading, and storing my keystrokes. Let's see how it works. What you're looking at here is the Google homepage in the new Chrome browser. However, this issue is not specific to Chrome, as the feature works on all browsers the same way. And on the lower part of the screen, you're looking at a tool used by computer network professionals called the Packet Sniffer. We'll use this Packet Sniffer to see what information Chrome is sending back to Google and when. Google has changed the typical request response pattern of the web with a little piece of JavaScript code that says every time the user types a letter, send it to me. In this case, I'm going to type the first few letters of the word marijuana. Watch what happens over the network. As you can see, each letter gets sent to Google until it can tell I probably want the word marijuana. Now I'm a fairly private person, so before I click the submit button, I think to myself, hey, 
looking around the internet for illegal drugs from my home computer is probably not too smart. So I never click the Google search button and click the backspace button a bunch of times. The problem is it's too late. Google already has the information. I didn't know this was happening. I didn't intend to give this information. I didn't click anything. It could be worse. What if I type something more serious like this? And it's not just Google that can see this information. Anyone with a packet sniffer between me and Google can see that I type this. This means that if I'm surfing the internet from work, my company can see this. If I'm surfing from a wireless connection at Starbucks, Starbucks can see this. My ISP can see it. And if my government is watching, not just me specifically, but any part of the internet between me and Google, they can see it too. To make matters worse, Google has stored this information on their computers. So if someone with a warrant demands this information, they can see this information as well. In 2007, the rights group Privacy International rated Google as hostile to privacy. It's lowest rating in their report. Even last week when questioned about Google's privacy track record, Schmidt attempted to defend the company. We try to be as transparent as possible. We publicly state these are the things that we can do with your data. From our perspective, we disclosed what we were doing. Now we're criticized for not disclosing what we're doing. If we were to violate your privacy, that would be material. We would lose you. Independent of whether you like us, we have a clear business perspective to protect your privacy. Because if we don't, we'll lose you. Governments will write laws that restrict this, will suffer penalties and get sued to death because we get sued for everything. No, Schmidt, you have violated our privacy repeatedly and you frequently get sued because your company has a complete and total disregard for our privacy, violating laws in horrendously unethical ways. You've intentionally developed systems that are designed to strip away our basic human right to privacy. But I suppose, what else can we expect from a man who once said, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Well, that's it from me for today. To stay up to date with all the news that you're not supposed to know, visit rinf.com and subscribe to the free newsletter. Thank you for watching. I'm Mick Meaney, signing off for Rinf Alternative News. The systematic logging and data profiling of our children has long been feared by privacy advocates and with good reason, but what happens when schools begin gathering and storing data about your children without parental consent and begin selling that sensitive information to corporations? Welcome to Rinf Alternative News, I'm Mick Meaney and in this video report we're going to look at how millions of students in the United States have been placed on what certainly appears to be a national database without parental consent. The controversial database created by InBloom Inc, a non-profit organisation, tracks student test scores, learning disabilities, discipline records, even teacher assessments of a child's character 
right from the very beginning of a child's education right through to high school. The system has cost $100 million to create and was mainly funded by the Gates Foundation, which they are now calling a blueprint for the future. In Bloom state that the database will allow more individualized learning that is geared towards improving student performance. Now I'll show you a promotional video from the organization so you can see exactly how in Bloom claims it will benefit students and teachers. Here's a teacher with just a few of the students in a typical classroom, Brandon and Maria and Karen and Jimmy. Each is unique, they're at different stages and need different ways to get where they need to go. She has ideas for how to help each one, but to do that forces her to focus on each student, think about the teaching tools and approaches that help each student on their journey, deal with truckloads of student data that may or may not work together, or with other teaching materials she likes to use, then come up with a specific plan and get the best lessons and content for it. And the tools for all of this just add more complexity. As a result, it's nearly impossible for her to give each of her students exactly what they need, unless she has better tools. And in Bloom is creating shared data services to make data speak the same language and make it easier to create teaching materials that work with that data which opens the door to creating new, customized learning maps and curriculum, along with an engine to easily find and share them. So when Maria needs an extra challenge to keep her engaged with math, or Brandon needs a different approach to reading, one that works with his love of spaceships, it's at her fingertips. It also helps her turn that flood of assessment and formative data into something that gives actual insight, so she can see exactly where they are and what they need, and adapt in real time. Tools that give teachers better access to information from each other across the hall or across the country. In Bloom has launched the services necessary to build better tools for our teachers and classrooms, including a cloud-based data store, standardized metadata tagging language, and an open license API for building software applications. Now that's a positive sentiment, even if a naive one, but the organization uses some questionable tactics to enforce their message. I'll give you one example here which I found particularly disturbing. It's another video taken from In Bloom's promotional material which features a seventh grade teacher saying that the system is a good way to let children know they are loved and cared for. Just watch this. It's not necessarily about the technology. It's about the kids and, and it's about letting kids know that, that, that somebody loves them and somebody cares about them. As you can see, it's obviously designed to pull at the heartstrings, a propaganda technique that's designed to emotionally manipulate parents and teachers. The suggestion that allowing a child's information to be profiled and held on a database is the way to show them you care is absolutely insane. But it's a tactic that seems to be working. There are currently over 11 million students on the database across nine states including New York, Colorado, Delaware, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Massachusetts and North Carolina. Okay so propaganda and manipulation tactics to one side for the moment. The basic idea of improved learning does sound positive in theory but we need to discover at really what cost. Let's have a look at their privacy statement. It says and I quote in Bloom Inc. cannot guarantee the security of the information stored in In Bloom or that the information will not be intercepted when it's being transmitted. Hmm. So what exactly information could be intercepted? Well, students' names, addresses, race, economic status, grades, standardized uh, test scores, disciplinary records, health records, and disabilities could all be obtained by hackers. Now, okay, almost every system is vulnerable to hackers and I'm no legal expert, but in my opinion, this statement seems like a get out clause, which means in Bloom have no legal obligation to protect children's data. And speaking of security, the data itself is stored on Amazon servers. Yep, the same Amazon that has been repeatedly hacked. But Amazon isn't the only corporation connected to the InBloom database. It's also Wireless Generation, a technology company that's actually a subsidiary of News Corporation, which of course is owned by billionaire media mogul Rupert Murdoch. But Rupert Murdoch is trustworthy, right? I mean, he wouldn't violate anybody's privacy. It's not like he 
has been found guilty of illegally violating individuals' privacy in the UK and the US. Now, according to Class Size Matters, a New York-based education advocacy group, Embloom intends to make all this highly confidential data available to commercial vendors to help them develop and market learning products. So, according to Class Size Matters, how was Embloom formed and what exactly is its connection to the Gates Foundation? Well, in 2011, the Gates Foundation formed a private company called the Shared Learning Collaborative, which then spun off into a separate corporation called Imbloom Inc. This corporation was designed to collect confidential student and teacher data provided to them by states and districts throughout the United States to be stored on a data cloud and then shared with software vendors and other commercial education ventures to help them develop and market their products. There are serious questions about the legality and the ethical nature of the project. The US Department of Education recently rewrote the regulations for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act to allow more liberal sharing of student data. And that went into effect in January of 2012. You see, previously only a school official with a legitimate educational interest or an employee or contractor directly supervised by that official could have access to a student's personal information and in most cases could not redisclose that information. The Obama administration broadly expanded the definition of school official. In response, the Electronic Privacy Information Center filed a lawsuit claiming that the new regulations violate the law. The plan to share personally identifiable and highly confidential student data in such an unrestricted manner and in an open-ended time frame without parental notification or consent is unprecedented in US history and would violate both the Federal Trade Commission and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So here we've got a potentially illegal system being built and funded by corporations with no opportunity to opt out in many cases that's collecting sensitive information about children and if class size matters are correct that information is then being made available to corporations. Now there's something very wrong with this picture. It appears that federal and state departments of education are handing over policy to corporate executives with little or no classroom experience. In fact, in Bloom's five member board only has one teacher. The others are at best educational advisors and its chief executive officer is actually a software developer. So what can you do about this? Well, there are now two bills, one in the assembly A06059 and one in the Senate. SO4284. These bills would prohibit the disclosure of highly personal student information to third party corporations and would specify cases for disclosure. It would also hold the state districts and boards of education legally responsible for security breaches. So email your legislators and tell them to pass these bills. At the very least, your children need and deserve their privacy. Well, that's all from me for today. For more news that you're not supposed to know, visit rinf.com and subscribe to the free DigiSign. Thank you for watching. I'm Mick Meany signing off for Rinf Alternative News. Imagine this scenario. You're within a hundred miles of the US border and a border patrol agent pulls you to one side and demands to search you, your vehicle, your possessions including your electronic devices like your phone and your laptop. No reason is given and they claim that you do not have the legal right to stop them. So now you have a choice to comply or to resist. You're about to see the actual footage of what happens to someone when they attempt to defend the Fourth Amendment right. Welcome to RINF News, I'm Mick Meany and in this report we're going to examine reports from America that have long indicated 
that border agents have been using questionable stop and search procedures on travellers who enter or leave the country and also on those within a 100 mile radius of the border potentially affecting 190 million Americans who fall within that radius and the directive does not define who a traveller is. Now you're about to watch a video of a pastor Stephen Anderson who refused to be searched and the hideous treatment he received being beaten and tased as a result. I must warn you the following scenes are disturbing. Well, let me ask this. Are you placing me under arrest? You are under arrest. And Where what what right crime now? what crime am I being charged with? Hey, these guys are telling me that a canine alerted to your vehicle for the presence. And I've asked repeatedly for that dog to be brought back out because I say that it didn't happen. And they are refusing to get the dog back out because they know that they're not telling the truth. You can do one because I wouldn't answer their questions, they came up with that. Or I'm going to take you out of the car. Well, let me ask this. What are you, when you place someone under arrest, don't you have to put them under arrest for something specific? Okay. I'm a police officer. I'm ordering you out of the car. Will you answer my question, police officer? Yes. I'm a police officer. What are you placing me under arrest for? Prefer to obey me right now. As a so I have to car. obey you by law? Yes, you do. Even when you're okay. stopping me without cause? As we can clearly see, the treatment of citizens can be horrific now. Yes, security must be paramount, but for some time now, many civil liberty groups have rightly questioned the seemingly irrational searching of citizens in this manner. At the moment, border agents do not need a warrant. They do not need to have reasonable suspicion, and they essentially just need to have a hunch. Now, as you can imagine, civil liberties groups have challenged this under the Fourth Amendment, which is really designed to protect civil rights. Here's a quick reminder of the Fourth Amendment. Now, as you can clearly see, it states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized now, for those of you who aren't aware of this directive, the ramifications are probably best explained by Harley Geiger from the Center for Democracy and Technology, who spoke to Russia today. Now, he mainly focuses on the warrantless searching of electronic devices. Americans have a diminished expectation of privacy at the border. Uh, however, when they search laptops or PDAs or cell phones, it actually reveals an enormous amount of information about ourselves, our personal lives, our financial records, our relationships, uh, medical history, etc. And these are the things that the Fourth Amendment was designed to protect, and now it's being subverted in the name of national security. So there's an argument to be made both ways. And I know that you guys recently uncovered new rules regarding these searches, and maybe the policy has changed a little bit. Have, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, there was uh, FOIA litigation, Freedom of Information Act, litigation through EFF and uh, they had uncovered n rules that had been changed in 2007 actually uh, so it's not announced under the Obama administration that these are new it was just uncovered that this was the policy um, but the policy had changed in 2007 now there is no suspicion required whatsoever uh, for federal agents at the border to search your laptops or your electronic devices and to copy the material that is on them previously prior to 2007 and since 1986 uh, they required reasonable suspicion to detain a laptop or an electronic device and probable cause to seize or copy it now those protections are gone except 
they still need probable cause to seize it, and they need reasonable suspicion to share it for, with another federal agency like the NSA or the CIA, which they will do if they need to decrypt it or they need help understanding the contents. And what exactly are they looking for? I mean, can they look through these laptops and get your email and look through your Facebook accounts or something like that? I mean, what are they trying to prevent by doing these searches? They can get anything that is on those electronic devices. Now, electronic devices is very broad. It includes MP3 players. So they can look through the music files on your MP3 player if they want to. Yes, they can look through your Facebook profile. They can look through any file that is on those, on those devices. Uh, what they're looking for, uh, generally, they're looking for anything. Uh, anything that indicates that a crime has been committed. Uh, more specifically, they're looking for child pornography, they're looking for uh, evidence uh, that the person trying to cross the border is not who he or she says that they are, um, that he or she might be a terrorist, or that he or she is lying about their immigration status. Um, so it's a very, very broad search. Okay, now that you've been brought up to speed, let's fast forward to February of 2013. The Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the Department of Homeland Security released an executive summary of its findings to justify the warrantless searches of phones and laptops. However, it refused to release the details of its analysis. So essentially, the US government gets accused of acting outside the law, so the government conducts a review of itself and, surprise, surprise, decides that it has done nothing wrong. Well, what else is new? Okay, well, last week, in response to a Freedom of Information Act request filed by the American Civil Liberties Union, the Department of Homeland Security finally released its complete December 2011 Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Impact Assessment. So let's take a closer look at how the Department of Homeland Security attempts to defend itself. The assessment first counters by noting the issue is an important one, even though it affects only a very small proportion of many millions of travelers who enter the United States each month. Now, according to the government's own figures, there were 302 travelers subject to electronic device searches in 2009 and 383 in 2010. Now, still, that raises the question, what is the government's constitutionally based reason for such searches? Now, frankly, we don't know, and a lot of what they have provided is redacted. On page 18 of the 52-page document, another section entitled First Amendment, several paragraphs have been completely blacked out. The DHS also says that it definitely can't change its policies to be suspicion-based, as it would be operationally harmful, but it fails to say why. Now, not surprisingly, the ACLU takes issue with this line of reasoning in a blog post they wrote. To be sure, rummaging around through people's personal papers may well turn up the occasional bad guy, but that is not the only consideration. No doubt law enforcement agents would also find it useful to walk into people's homes at will, but we don't allow them to do so because that would intrude on our reasonable expectation of privacy in our homes. And just as we reasonably expect privacy in our homes, so too do we expect that border agents will not base their decisions to search through our electronic information on a whim or a hunch. Put another way, requiring law enforcement agents to possess subjective reasons for a search is a feature of our constitutional framework and not a bug. So what we essentially have here is the warrantless searching for no good reason other than because they feel like it. That's a completely irrational and illogical stance that violates the civil liberties of hundreds of people each year. Well, I'm almost out of time for today. For more news that you're not supposed to know, visit rymph.com. Thanks for watching, I'm Mick Meany signing off for Rymph Alternative News.